Well, tonight we're going to look again at God's Word, and I'm going to invite you to turn with me to Psalm 93. Psalm 93 is, um, as, you, as you see this psalm, I'll read it in just a moment, but it's a psalm that begins with the words, the Lord reigns. And uh, if, you've, if you look in your Bibles over to Psalm 99, you would see the same thing. Uh, the Lord reigns. So these two psalms kind of act as bookends to a series of psalms, a little mini collection of in the Psalter that's, I think, focused primarily on the kingdom of God. And so even as this morning we were considering how the Lord sends out workers into the harvest in order to make them aware that the kingdom of God has come near. Um, tonight we're going to be reading a psalm that was written almost a thousand years earlier than when Jesus' ministry took place on the earth. But it would be a psalm looking to, to the kingdom. And we're going tonight, uh, by God's grace, uh, consider some of the aspects of the kingdom of God as we look at, at this particular psalm. So let me uh, read this psalm to you, so please give your attention to the reading of God's Word as we read Psalm 93, these five verses. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. Mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Thus ends the reading of God's word. Let's, uh, let's again turn to the Lord and ask for his help as we turn to this passage of Scripture tonight. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us again your word. We, Lord, pray that as we come be, to consider uh, what your word says tonight, that you will give us eyes to see. Give us, Lord, a heart that would desire to receive your word, to live by it, and to live for it. And so we do ask that, Lord, you will grant to us by your spirit great understanding, and that we might worship you as a result, and that we would desire to live for you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. should have mentioned again, I'm, I'm reading tonight uh, from the translation I normally use, which is the English Standard Version. I, I think the version of, of that uh, Pastor Bryant normally uses is New American Standard, and that's probably displayed above me. But they're, they're not that different. I, I might draw attention to a couple of words I know that are different in these two translations as we work our way through these five verses tonight. I'd like to look at this passage under three heads this evening. Uh, the first two verses, we're going to look at the nature of God's kingdom, the nature of God's kingdom. I'm going to break that down even a little bit more into, into four subheadings, but the nature of God's kingdom we see brought out in the first two verses. Then we're going to, in verses 3 and 4, consider God's triumph over his enemies. God's triumph over his enemies. And then the last verse, verse 5, we're going to consider God's faithful word. And I'll remind you of those as we go through this. So again, the nature of, of God's uh, kingdom in verses 1 and 2. The opening verse here, in, in a way, forcefully reminds us that God is reigning in heaven, uh, that that the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, is the one who is enthroned. Uh, when uh, the godly king Uzziah died during the time of Isaiah, Isaiah contemplated this, and he was concerned. Who would fill the vacancy in Jerusalem? Who would be there who would, be, who would ascend to the throne? And God granted Isaiah a vision that we read in, in uh, Isaiah chapter 6, a vision, and he says, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. So there was an idea, there was a picture of the reign of God on the throne that was afforded to Isaiah. The fact that the Lord is reigning pro proclaims this truth to us tonight. But it's a reign not of only a being, but one of action 
We're going to see that a little bit more. God is overseeing, He is governing, He is caring for His uh, creation and all of those uh, creatures uh, according to His holy will. So I'd like to look at this, this, these two verses, actually, the, the, to understand the nature of God's kingdom by considering uh, four different words in, this, in these two verses. And the first word I'd like to consider is majestic, uh, because it says that he is robed. He is robed, in, in, and this is the, the majesty of his, he's robed in majesty. So it is a, it's a kingdom that is majestic. We don't use that word perhaps a lot. What does it mean? It perhaps speaks to a stateliness, a grandeur. Uh, we can think of kings and monarchs. Perhaps they have jewels in their crown or even uh, gold, crowns of gold. And that, that says something about, about their reign. Um, and we can also learn something about the nature of the, the majesty of a kingdom when we look at perhaps the subjects that are in the presence of the monarch. Isaiah, for example when he comes and in that vision sees a picture of God on the throne. Uh, what happens to Isaiah? What does he do? Well, he falls down in realization of his own sin. Uh, he's, he suddenly cries out uh, that I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the, in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, when he saw Yahweh uh, in that vision he recognized his own sinful uh, condition and his unworthiness, and he falls down in front of him. John the Apostle on the Isle of Patmos, much the same when he comes face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ in his glorified state, falls down on his face. He's, he sees uh, the king, his, his king, his Lord, and that's the, that is his response, to know your sin and, and to worship before the one who deserves it. And putting on this robe and, and the, the, the vestments and, the, and, the, and perhaps the, the place where the king is seated is, is significant. But uh, as we compare it to an earthly king, really it's only just a veneer of majesty by, by, um, uh, by, by comparison. Matthew Henry says that the majesty of earthly princes compared with God's terrible majesty, is but like the glimmerings of a glowworm compared with the brightness of the sun. That's the, kind of the comparison. And that's even not a perfect comparison. But that it's like the glowworm, the light glimmerings of a glowworm compared with the brightness of the sun when he goes forth in his strength. Are the enemies of God's kingdoms great? Matthew Henry continues to ask. And formidable? Well, of course, he says, let us not fear them, for God's majesty will eclipse theirs. Now, that's a sense of the majesty of, of God ruling, so the majesty of his kingdom. Jesus, of course, humbled himself when he came uh, in his incarnation to uh, minister on the earth. But there, there were times when uh, the, we could say that even the glory of Christ shines through. You can think about the fact that when he was a babe, in a manger in Bethlehem, the kings of the east came, and when they came and saw the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, they bowed down and worshipped him, and they gave him kingly gifts. When Jesus was arrested in the garden, John's gospel records for us in John chapter 16, Judas has come, has identified uh, Jesus of Nazareth, and they ask, are you Jesus of Nazareth? And Jesus says, I am he. And the guards immediately fall down. They cannot stand. They fall down. Because there are just a moment, as he uses those words, I am, I am he, uh, the, there was a sense of, of the glory of Christ that shines through and causes the, the, the authorities to fall to their feet. And even on the cross, as Jesus is crucified at the very end, of course, the centurion uh, did declare that this was the Son of God. So there, there are these moments in Jesus' earthly ministry, but much more, of course, now when his majesty is coming and is shining through. So there's the majesty of, 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 the, of, of God's kingdom. But second of all, it says in verse 1, he has put on strength as his belt. And I'd like to think of this as 
the fact that God's kingdom is mighty. It's not only majestic, but it, it is mighty. He's put on strength as his belt, or I think in the New American Standard, says girded himself with, with this strength. You know, there are, there are a number of rulers in the world who might think that they actually have quite a bit of power. Um, I was thinking about that this week when uh, we heard about the fact that the Afghan president, I think his name was Ghani, um, had to flee the country, and he showed up in the United Arab Emirates. Well, he maybe still has the title president of Afghanistan, but it's really just a, it's just a title. Does it have any power? Does he have any authority? Does he have any, any uh, way to conduct the affairs of any land? Well, of course not. And in a, in a very short period of time, it was pretty obvious that he no longer uh, will have any power because he derives his power from others. But God does not de derive his power uh, from anyone else, not from his worshipers, certainly not from those who oppose him, but it is a part of his own divine nature. And all the power that we need, of course, is, is, uh, is his power, whether for faith or obedience or even the success of the gospel ministry. It is all found in God and in himself because of his own nature. So God's kingdom is majestic. It is mighty. And then we read in, verse, in the end of this verse, in verse 1, it says, yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. And so we can say that also God's kingdom is characterized by his sovereignty. It is sovereign. Um, Richard Phillips is a PCA minister who has written a commentary on this psalm, and he points out that the point of this statement is not that the earth is fixed in space with the sun orbiting about it, as maybe some, earthly, uh, some early uh, or medieval uh, theologians may have uh, postulated, it's not, that's not what's meant by the fact that the earth is established and not shall, not shall be moved, not that everything rotates about the earth, but rather the emphasis is, is on moral, not scientific or astronomical. God's order and righteousness uh, cannot be overthrown uh, for, for his kingdom. His, his will for the world is unshakable and it is, it is fixed. And so when we do pray the prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be none, we can be sure that God's will is going to be accomplished. So there is God's sovereignty. So the kingdom is characterized by sovereignty. And then fourth, we see in verse 2 that your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. And there I think we can say in the fourth place that God's kingdom is eternal. His throne is established from old and he is from everlasting. The, his kingdom did not have a beginning, does not have an end. Everything that exists uh, had, its, had its being because of God and owes its worship and obedience to, to God. So these are the characteristics, we could say, of the na or the nature of God's kingdom. Uh, it's it's an aspect of what we should think about when we think about God's kingdom as it's, as it's coming, as it's, as it's been revealed. God is... His, his majesty is worthy of our praise. Uh, God in his sovereignty can, uh, can be relied on to fulfill all that he has promised. And in his eternal being, he can be trusted uh, to uh, remain always the same. And in his power, we can always appeal to him uh, for help and be sure that he hears us and can answer our, our, our petitions. So that is the nature of God's kingdom. But let us go on to look into the next two verses, verses 3 and 4. Uh, verses 3 and 4 really speak, I believe, to the triumph that God has over his enemies. Because even though God's kingdom is majestic, it is mighty, it is sovereign and eternal, that does not stop sinful men from seeking to rebel against him. And we see that in these, in these two verses, the floods have lifted up, O Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice, the floods lift up their roaring. And the psalmist here is really not speaking uh, so much about a, a, a real flood or real waters. He's using it as a metaphor to depict the opposition uh, to God's holy rule. We can see that in other places. It's, uh, this, uh, this metaphor is used and it can be found, for example, in Isaiah 57 verse 20 to depict the rebellion of sinners against God. Let me read it for you. 
It, re it reads, the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet, and its waters toss up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked, Isaiah 57, verse 20. So that's a picture that we see in this, in this passage here. There's an emphasis, especially on the noise that's being brought by those that are rebelling against God and his plan. They have lifted up their voices. It's very much like uh, what we read in Psalm chapter 2 at the beginning of our service. You can go back and read that again at your, in your own, uh, at your own time. Uh, we see that rebellion of the world, rebelling against, against God and rebelling against his son. Sometimes from our perspective, that, that opposition can be um, concerning. Sometimes we wonder, well, is God truly in control? But we, we need to be reminded that God is sovereign, that God is reigning, that God is mighty, and that he can, uh, that he can put all of these things uh, in place according to his own purpose. But it doesn't stop the fact that we see perhaps in, in Africa there are Christians that are being persecuted, sometimes being martyred for their faith. Uh, it doesn't stop the fact that in some places uh, there are uh, governments that are seeking to suppress the truth, and much of which we could say is true in China or North Korea or a number of other nations today. There, is, there, are, there are threats of violence, uh, there are threats of opposition, and uh, it's, it goes on and on and on. And that's kind of the sense you get uh, in verse 3. We notice there the repetition of the word, the floods, the floods, the floods, the floods. It's a relentless opposition going on against God's holy order. And so how do we, how do we respond? What's, what response should we have? Should we be in fear? Should we fret? Should we be angry about it? Well, I think the psalmist lays out for us a way in which we should respond in verse 4. We should be remembering, of course, to pray and, and be reminded that the mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea, is the Lord. The Lord is on high and he is mighty. We can remember to bring these before the Lord and seek that God would do what is, what is necessary in his own time. There's a good example of this, I think, in, in uh, 2 Kings in chapter 19. At that time, King Hezekiah was the king of the southern, it was the southern king, king of, of uh, Judah, and he was being besieged by the king of Assyria. His name was Sennacherib, and Sennacherib's forces had surrounded the city of Jerusalem. They cut off the water, cut off the food. It looked pretty dire for those in Jerusalem, and he had sent messengers to really taunt the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he finally sends a letter, basically saying, uh, if you don't surrender, things are going to be really very, very bad for you. And when King Hezekiah receives that letter, he takes the letter, he goes into the, into the house of the Lord and says he spreads it out before the Lord. And then he prays in Second Kings chapter 19, verse 16, he prays this prayer, Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see and hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. See what uh, King Hezekiah did? He went before the Lord and said, Lord, please uphold your own name. Do not let the heathen nations disgrace your name and bring, it, uh, bring the people of your own people to ruin. Well, Hezekiah asked God to do this, and of course the Lord's angel was sent by the Lord to destroy uh, Sennacherib's uh, forces and Sennacherib slinked back to Assyria where he was later put to death by his own son. So we see in this example that uh, God does hear our, our cry to him. He does uphold his own name and that's a good way for us to pray when we're in the midst of uh, the, those opponents of him. Uh, the the um, Jesus in his earthly ministry even of course did calm the waves at times. Now, they weren't necessarily always the waves due to sin, but they, again, were a demonstration of his own power that were on the Sea of Galilee that he could, he could by his own power, bring uh, calm and, and to, the, to the storms and, and remove the waves. 
And Jesus Christ is now at the right hand of the throne of God and is interceding for us. And so as we encounter those waves uh, in our lives, uh, we can cry out to him and ask that, that he would, uh, would calm them again. In uh, the second stanza of Be Still My Soul, there is this refrain, Be still my soul, the waves and winds still know his voice who ruled them while he dwelt below. So it's a good r reminder that, that uh, things are not out of control, that our God is, is, has, uh, is majestic, that he has strength, that he is sovereign, unchanging, and he can overcome his and our uh, foes. The history of the church also in some ways proves uh, what we read in, in verse 4 of Psalm 93, because down through, through history there are examples of uh, kings who have tried to silence Christians, uh, the emperors in, uh, of Rome in the first and second uh, centuries did try to, to wipe out all of the Christians that were living at that time. They made martyrs of them, but that only, tr in some sense, uh, was a, a seed for the gospel to continue to go forth and the church uh, to grow. Uh, we, could, we could even think of more recently in, in um, the time of the Enlightenment in, in Europe, there was a rationalism that was trying to, to um, damp out the, the entire Christian faith, but it, it only really served to fan in some ways, again, uh, the seeds of faith which led to uh, the, uh, the evangel evangelizing parts of Europe, which would then also uh, cause the gospel to come to America, where it would continue to, to spread. And even the terrors of China or other places that seek to suppress uh, the truth of God's word cannot do that. Jesus Christ said in John chapter 16, verse 33, in the world you will have tribulation. It's no question. We're going to continue to have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. John 16, verse 33. So the opposition to, the, to God cannot stand and, and in the end will not be successful. So, so thus far we've seen that God's kingdom is majestic, it's mighty, sovereign, and eternal. He's able to, to um, by his power, stem the control of sin in the world, control the raging waters of sin and unbelief. And that brings us then to this uh, final verse in this psalm, verse 5. And that reminds us that God rules in this world by his word. So verse 5, your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. The word in Hebrew that's translated in the ESV as decrees, or I think in the New American Standard as testimonies, is, gives the sense of a message going out as a herald from the king. Uh, so there's, a, there's an authority to that word. There's a, there's a stateliness of that word. Uh, in other words, the word coming forth is, is important. It's not just something trivial, but it is, it, it is uh, life-giving in, in the case of God's Word. It's, uh, it's confirmed. It's, it's, a, tr it's a true um, proclamation. There's no, no ambiguity about it. We, we can certainly know that this Word is truth. And um, the point here is that uh, even as, the, as God can, can def defend His people from the raging waters, He can and will keep His Word and he'll give it to us, and he's going to uh, by it uphold it. Uh, Jesus Christ says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 35, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Uh, there is a, there's a, the promise of God's word. God's word is, is trustworthy. And because it's trustworthy, there's a great need for people in every age to believe the Bible, to know it, to receive it, to meditate upon it, and to stand upon it in faith. And we should, of course, be spreading this word uh, to the world. We should pray for the, preach, the faithful preaching of this word uh, to go forth. And we ought to really be in prayer uh, for the Great Commission. Uh, Jesus Christ commissioned his disciples in Matthew chapter 28, uh, verse 19 and 20. He said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So in the, in the Great Commission, 
uh, Jesus Christ gives to the church, gives to his disciples, but to the church as, as well, the commission to preach the good news, and, and, it's, and but to teach also to teach them to observe all that I commanded you. There's there is in the great commission included the teaching and preaching of all of God's word. And so, uh, please uh, pray for that uh, for that commission. Pray for it in uh, the preaching of your own pastor as he labors in the word week by week, morning and evening. Pray for the missionaries of our church and other churches that we're aware of that are faithfully uh, proclaiming the gospel, not only in, in North America, but perhaps around the world. Pray that the word would be carried forth and that this would usher in the kingdom. In the word that's uh, translated in the ESV as trustworthy or confirmed in the New American Standard, uh, that word is actually taken from the root from which we get the word amen. So when it says that your decrees are very trustworthy, it's almost as if it's saying your decrees are, the, are, are amen. And so it is a word that we use, of course, to, uh, to confirm the truth of God's word. When we say amen at the end of a, of a hymn or at any time in the service or at the end of a prayer, we're, giving, uh, we're saying we agree with the testimony of God's word. And so... Uh, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, true of, of every portion of Scripture. Really, we should be asking ourselves, have you given your amen to God's Word? Are you receiving God's Word, and are you uh, living by it? Uh, the, the, the Bible calls us to place our faith in the only one who uh, took upon himself uh, human flesh in order to live a human life perfectly and die in our place for our sins in order to present us as righteous in him. The Bible calls us to place our trust in Jesus Christ alone, and if we do that, then we're saying amen uh, to the perfect work of our Savior as it is proclaimed in his word. So God can call us to uh, not only stand on his word for salvation, but also uh, to stand fast as we live our lives in the world as well. And we can be sure that we're standing fast that the Lord will bless it. Uh, in, the, in the ending portion of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24, there is the story of the man, two men, that, builds, that build houses. And, and, and one builds his house on the rock, one builds his house on the, on the sand. And it says in verses 24 and 25, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And so uh, we, we need to know God's word. We need to be affirming it as true. We need to be establishing our lives on the truth of his word uh, so that uh, we will stand firm to the very end. If we, and if we have God's word, and if we're saying amen to it, there's one more thing which we should do here. And that is, it says in that verse, holiness befits your house. Holiness befits your house. What's that talking about? Well, it's talking about the fact the house is the, is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the household, it says, it needs to be holy. And so how is it going to be holy? Well, it's going to be holy if God's people take up holy lives. In Leviticus, we have, as, as, is, as it is repeated for us in the, letter, uh, the first letter of Peter, that we are to be holy as God is holy. We are to imitate our, our, our master. We're to imitate the Lord Jesus Christ in his holiness. We're to be holy as he is holy. So it's important for us to live our lives day by day, uh, not just on Sunday, but on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, throughout the entire week, we need to live our lives according to God's revealed commands. Uh, Jesus Christ says to us that if you have my commands and keep it, then you love me. That's how we show our love for the Lord Jesus Christ is by keeping his commands, by saying amen to what is, what is revealed in God's word. The last word we have here in this psalm uh, is forevermore in the ESV or length of days, I might be in the New American Standard, 
It's translated something like that. It's to the end of the days. And the point is that God's Word is trustworthy for all times. God calls us uh, to, be, um, to be His servants, and it's a privilege and a duty of faith that to, which yields uh, fruit in its time if we do so faithfully, uh, to be His servants and to come into His house. And how do we do that? Part of it is by coming uh, in to worship Him on the Lord's Day. So we're doing that uh, this evening. We're, we're, we are... Uh, this is holiness that befits the Lord's house when God's people gather in His name. He promises to be with us, and we worship Him. But even more than that, it's, it's a glorious thought to think that we are actually in some ways preparing uh, for worship in heaven. You think about that right now on this day, of course, the angels are in heaven worshiping the Lord. The saints are gathered around uh, the Lord today, but we in our in our um, own way today, no matter how, uh, no matter what it looks like to the world, we are practicing and preparing uh, for eternity, as as and to uh, eternity of when, in which we will be worshiping in heaven. We worship a God who is majestic, who is mighty, who is sovereign, eternal, and we are celebrating, of course, Christ Jesus' victory over sin. And over over the uh, over his uh, over Satan and over evil, and we also are in this way uh, practicing uh, for our eternal heavenly worship of Him. So holiness befits your house. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we we give thanks that you've called us to be a part of your kingdom. We're just a small part of the kingdom, but we give praise to you that we may gather tonight in your name that we may offer up our praise and worship to you. We thank you that you're sovereignly ruling over all of creation and over your church, and that is a rule that is from everlasting to everlasting. We thank you again for the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, in order that we might have your riches. And so we ask that, Lord, you will continue to bless the ministry of your church, bless the proclamation of your word, and may we say amen to it in the Lord Jesus' name. And we do say amen.